Okay, am I able to go? I think this is streaming. All right. Greetings, everyone. My name is Kelsey Merrick Wagner, and I am a PhD candidate as of today at Michigan State University in the Department of Anthropology. I'm also an environmental artist and activist, um, and my research focuses on human elephant relationships and the use of art in environmental activist movements. Uh, my work is partly funded by the Lu Southeast Asia Grant to Michigan State University, the Mekong Culture Well Project. On behalf of our co-organizers -organiz at the University of Hawaii, the East West Center and Chiang Mai University's Regional Center for Social Science and Sustainability, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome everyone in this webinar to this webinar on chronicling transitions, documentarians, and writers. We want to spend a, a special thanks of gratitude to the Luce Foundation for its support of our ongoing collaborations. And we invite everyone and anyone in the audience who would like to know more about our work or the webinar series to reach out to us. The University of Hawaii East-West Center and the Michigan State University webinar series on Southeast Asia and transition has been ongoing for almost two years now. This morning or this evening's event, depending on where you are standing, follows on themes that have arisen in our previous webinars on water justice, palm, palm oil plantainization of Southeast Asia, migrations and mobilities in the region, spiritual landscapes and forest rights, among many others. The links to these webinars will be placed in the chat for all viewers to access. To this end, our panel tonight will extend many of these fruitful discussions. So without further delay, I am pleased to introduce you to this amazing panel. We have Kalyani Mam, who is a storyteller and documentary filmmaker. Tasco Santoso, who is an author, uh, journalist, and coffee maker, or sorry, coffee farmer. And Emily Hong, who is a filmmaker, assistant professor of anthropology and visual studies at Haverford College. Um, so as a way to begin, I'll invite the panelists to introduce themselves and talk about how their work intersects with the concerns of tonight's theme, which again is chronicling transitions, documentarians, and writers. So thank you, and I look forward to an awesome panel. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so happy to be here. Thank you, Kelsey, for the introductions. And thank you, Jamin and Amanda, for overseeing everything. And I'm so happy to be here with Emily Hong and uh, Tosca Tosantoso as well this evening, um, evening for us at least <laughs> here in California. Um, I'm calling in from California, um, from Santa Rosa, California, to be exact. Um, land of um, the Pomo and Miwok. And uh, I've been living here with my partner and husband, you know, David Mendez for the last four years, but in Sonoma County for about 13 years now. So um, it's just been, uh, yeah, it's been really wonderful. Actually, this past weekend, I wanted to share with all of you, um, I went to, David and I went up the coast. Uh, we went to this place called Salt Point, and uh, we walked the rhododendron trail because the rhododendrons are out right now and in bloom here. And we walked and we found this beautiful redwood fairy ring, like, you know, all these redwood trees that were just like a ring of redwood trees. And the mother, I think, might have probably was, had been cut down maybe at the turn of the century when a lot of logging was going on here. Um, up uh, in the on the coast, you know, in California, and uh, but around her were all these trees that had sprouted up, and they're probably about a hundred years old now. Not as ancient as the mother, but you know, just as beautiful and and magnificent. And I looked at them, and they had kind of formed a wall around her, and I just like just stood there and just stayed there with them for a while. 
And I thought about the mother who passed away, you know, and I, and I thought about the trees that had grown around her, the children, you know, who had continued her legacy, but also the life that she lived, you know, and the life that she continued to give them, you know, as they grew around her. And it just gave me, I don't know, just filled me with hope and filled me with so much um, awe and wonder, you know, at this, you know, just this planet that we live on. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that with you because in a way, this story has a lot to do with my own, you know, journey and my own path as a storyteller. Um, the, you know, what inspired me in the beginning, you know, to, to tell stories and, but may, mostly really to listen to stories. Um, Cause I don't know if I can be a storyteller without a story listener. <laughs> and, you know, I think what inspired me to listen to stories was really the, the, the journey of my family. You know, we came from Cambodia. Um, I was born in Cambodia during the Khmer Rouge regime. And we fled Cambodia when I was two years old. Um, we were living in the refugee camps for about a year and a half, two years. And then we finally came to the United States when I was four years old. And all my life, I've been wondering, you know, what home means, you know, where I belong and, 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 you know, what home means to me because I never really felt like I belonged here. Um, so I wanted to understand like, where is it, you know, where is that home? So that question led me to return to Cambodia and I've been back in Cambodia for over two decades now and listening to the stories of families in Cambodia and um, understanding, you know, the history of Cambodia the devastating history that we went through, you know, during the Khmer Rouge regime and um, trying to understand their situation. And what I discovered when I was in Cambodia and, you know, returning to Cambodia to understand my home was that that home in Cambodia was also going through a rupture, you know, was also going through a transition. I mean, all of us had been displaced during the Khmer Rouge but even after the Khmer Rouge and after the reconstruction, you know, and after, you know, Cambodia was trying to transition into another economy, um, there was also another rupture that was happening that I felt was even just as devastating. And sometimes I wonder even maybe even more devastating than what we experienced during the Khmer Rouge. And that is the rupture caused by, you know, globalization and development. You know, so I went back to Cambodia and I lived with families and I listened to their stories, you know, about what they went through during the Khmer Rouge. But as I listened to their stories about what they went through the Khmer Rouge, I also began listening to their stories about what is happening to the Cambodian landscape and what is happening to the country right now, which is the total devastation, you know, of the forest, you know, total devastation of land for industrial agriculture, um, and the building of dams, you know, that is affecting the flow of water, you know, into the Great Belay Sap, which is the source of sustenance, you know, for us in Cambodia. And so as I was learning about the Khmer Rouge, I was learning about another genocide, you know, that was taking place in Cambodia, um, which is the genocide of our land, but also the genocide of our culture and traditions as people are being displaced, you know, from their land. So it's really interesting, you know, like I, at first I wanted to go back to Cambodia to try to understand my roots, to understand where I come from, to understand my homeland, to understand the place where my family and I were displaced from. But then when I went there, I ended up listening to stories of people who were being internally displaced themselves, you know, families who were also being uprooted in the same way that my family was uprooted. And, but instead of being like refugees, you know, and able to go somewhere else, they were refugees within their own homeland. And so that is, yeah, I, 
I, I mentioned um, the story of the redwoods in the beginning because I think these redwoods really reminded me, you know, this was very impactful for me because the trees here, and I know there's a history here too of destruction and displacement, you know, and of cultures being up, uprooted and people being uprooted and people being, you know, um, entire, you know, people being devastated. Um, but what the trees remind me is it's actually like who, who we really are, you know, as a people and, 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 and also as a, as an inhabitant or a, uh, I don't know if it's inhabitant is the right word, but as, as, as a part of the whole, you know, cycle and beauty of life, you know. And what the redwoods here have taught me is actually what the families in Cambodia have taught me too. You know, I, I think for the last 20 years, what I feel most grateful for And I, and I think maybe this is the, this could be one of the things we can talk about is what I feel most grateful for is the opportunity to listen, you know, to the stories of people who, unlike myself, who was displaced from my land, who actually had a chance to live on the land, who had a chance to live with the water for generations, you know, in Cambodia. And my ancestors too were able to do that. And they know what it feels like to live on the land and be with the water. They know what it means, you know, that that means a life of, you know, reciprocity, a life of giving, not just taking, a life of support, you know, and, 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 and community, you know, and the redwoods teach us this and the people who live on the land and with the water, they teach us the same thing too. At least they taught me. And I think that's one of the most important lessons I've, I've, could, I've ever learned, I could ever learn. Um, so with that, I'd like to share with you a clip um, from a film, a short film that I worked on with uh, for Emergence Magazine and with a dear my dear friend Emmanuel Von Lee and Adam Lofton we all worked together on this um, I shot it in Cambodia in the mangrove forest in Gokgong in the southwestern part of Cambodia and Pala uh, is featured in the film and she's just incredible and she you know honored me by allowing me to listen to her story and so now we are able to, you know, I'm able to share this story with you. Um, but this story is about Pala and it's about her community, you know, who live, you know, in Gosar Lao uh, on an island just off the coast. And in this community, um, people, they depend on the mangrove forest you know, for their livelihood, their sustenance, for the crab, for the fish, you know, for their way of life. And the mangrove forests also depend on them, you know, and all the creatures that live in the forest also depend on them. So it's like, an, it's like, it's the redwood forest I was telling you about, you know, it's the same thing. People living in harmony in the reciprocity with one another. However, the last few years, I guess it's been like, over 10 years now, 12 years now, there have been um, the sand, sand dredging of the mangrove forests. And the, the companies have come in to dredge the forest and have, are taking the sand and they're taking it to Singapore to build Singapore's land mass. You know, so they're taking land from someone's home to build the home for someone else and not even a home, you know, more like casinos and garden extravagant things, you know, that aren't necessary. And they're completely uprooting people's lives, you know, the lives of Pala and the life of her family and the life of her community. So I just wanted to share this clip with you just to see, um, and, you know, and it, and, it, and it, you know, Pala tells her story, 
Um, and uh, yeah, just to see what is going on there, but also maybe it can help frame other things that we're gonna talk about today. Um, you know, all the, the transitions that are happening and how are we as storytellers are going, to, are chronicling that transition. So uh, yeah, Jamin, if you can play it, that would be great. Thank you. Check out the mighty super trees on your left. You'll see the 22 meter high OCBC Skyway suspended from the taller super trees. You are now entering the cloud forest. This controlled climate is perfect for growing unique plants on the man-made mountain. ແລະគេជាប្រទេសដែលមានទឹកតែឥឡូវខ្លាចជាប្រទេសដែលមានដីគេយកដីនេះមកចាក់លឹងហើយបើសិនជាអត់ដីគឺយើងព្រៀបដូចជាមនុស្សដែលអត់ <coughs> Nó 
ปเคยปุกกอดต่างอ๊อกเนี่ยดาวยิ่งจังใหญ่ปลาปุกกอดฮะได้ในคือจีได้ยมจีได้มาพิสระยมใจยมอัดอันใหญ่กาวิปรุยมอัดใจพิซซาบอกปุกเกให้กายวิกาก็มดังท่าเธอไม่เกอันเดียวบ้านมันเตรมตัดสลายได้มันดังท่าทัวไอการ์ดไปได้ยังบาดเจ็บไปได้จีก้ามวยได้เนื้อตาไอไอก้าวนกดาตีตึกขอบคุณคุณแคลนนี่นั่นคือเรื่องที่สวยงามถ้าใครมีคำถามเกี่ยวกับงานของคุณฉันแนะนำให้เขาเข้ามาในแชทและเราจะตอบกลับมาในโอกาสต่อไปในการประชุมถ้าใครมีคำถามเกี่ยวกับงานของคุณฉันแนะนำให้เขาเข้ามาในโอกาสต่อไปในการประชุมถ้าใครมีคำถามเกี่ยวกับงานของคุณฉันแนะนำให้เขาเข้ามาในโอกาสต่อไปในการประชุมถ้าใครมีคำถามเกี่ยวกับงานของคุณฉันแนะนำให้เขาเข้ามาในโอกาสต่อไปในการประชุมถ้าใครมีคำถามเกี่ยวกับงานของคุณฉันแนะนำให้เขาเข้ามาในโอกาสต่อไปในการประชุมถ้าใครมีคำถามเกี่ยวกับงานของคุณฉันแนะนำให้เขาเข้ามาในโอกาสต่อไปในการประชุมถ้าใครมีคำถามเกี่ยวกับงานของคุณฉันแนะนำให้เขาเข้ามาใน Still blown away by by that excerpt, Kalyani. Thank you so much for mm. sharing your work. It's just, it's like science fiction, except it's except it's you know documentary, right? Um, so it's stunning, and I can't wait to talk more about that. Um, so um, as Kelsey mentioned, uh, my name is Emily Hong, and I'm a Korean American filmmaker and visual anthropologist. Um, a lot of my my work um, in terms of my film work and my written scholarship has involved um, long term field work and collaborations um, with political and environmental activists and artists in um, two countries in Southeast Asia, in Myanmar and in Thailand. And um, you know, I'm, I was originally born in Korea. I grew up in Korea, in England, and in the U.S. and I kind of ended up in Southeast Asia. Yeah, I didn't plan to end up there, right? And I was a student activist um, during uh, what is known as the Saffron Revolution in Myanmar, the uprising that happened, and got connected with, um, you know, my friend, my Burmese American friends basically got me connected with the exile community in New York and sucked me into the protests <laughs> um, in New York and. Um, Ended up after graduation, I moved to the Thailand Myanmar border, and so basically stayed there. So I've been living and working on and off in in Myanmar and Thailand, um, both both those countries, and especially on the border areas for almost 15 years. Um, and in general, if I have to kind of characterize my work, um, both my filmic work and and my written scholarship. Um, both are really concerned with challenging the colonial legacies of my disciplines, right? Anthropology um, and documentary. Um, and you know, one of the things I'm really I strive to do is to create space to honor um, non-Western ways of knowing and being. And these are things that I felt um, when I was a college student. You know, my my ancestors' knowledge wasn't. Um, honored, right, and wasn't um, celebrated in the same ways as, um, you know, the Greek philosophers say. So, <laughs> and political theorists. So that's kind of what I strive to offer um, in my work, um, and as as also as a as an educator as well. Um, so I'm going to be showing two short clips of my film work. One is from a two-channel um, video installation. A it's it's really actually meant to be experienced in more of an immersive environment, um, you know, like in a museum space or a gallery space. But you'll see, um, you can kind of imagine what it would be like, kind of in that space. But um, it's for my art, um, and it's um, I'm one of the directors. Um, it was also directed by Mary Angela Mihai and Mia Sara Lai, and We filmed this piece in 2014 um, at the very beginning of a 
uh, major transition, um, cr transition in quotes, because we didn't know what was going to happen, right? There was a lot of talk of as to what was happening in the country, moving from 60 years of military dictatorship to a semblance of democratic reforms. And this piece in the excerpt um, is, is really exploring the transition from the vantage point of performance artists. Um, so you'll see this clip, um, which really shows, um, you know, one particular performance. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that um, later on. And then the second clip you're going to see is, um, oh, and the performance artist's name is Emily Pio. Actually, we share a name. Um, and uh, her work, her, her piece is called Measurement. So that's the piece that you'll see. Um, the second clip is um, related to both my current feature film project, um, as well as my book project, which are related and kind of formed from, from you know, years of the same uh, research. And um, because my film is in post-production and I'm still revising the book manuscript, um, what I'm showing you is not a clip from the film, but it's a music, it's a clip from a music video actually of one of the artists that's highlighted in the film. Um, and their name is Blast and they are a rock band um, from Kitchen State in Myanmar. Um, they would probably prefer, uh, they would prefer it actually be referred to as Kitchen Land. Um, and they, like many others, see it as an unrecognized state in the borderlands of Myanmar, China, and India. Um, and um, this uh, particular uh, music video is called Sut Ngai Mungakamaka, which is natural resources. So they are, um, well, I think it speaks for itself, but what I will say is um, in the feature film, um, one of the inspirations behind the feature film project is um, basically when I went to Myanmar, um, you know, to, to begin this project, I was working with environmental activists and they said, oh, you're a filmmaker. You should, you should see these music videos. And I was like, yeah, I love music videos. Show me. And basically learned a story. I learned about a story that no one, I hadn't heard anywhere else. Um, and actually it's a very, uh, under told story in the country that is a, um, a music video, a kitchen music video is what sparked local resistance to a dam project. Um, that eventually led to the country's first nationwide environmental movement. So, um, so there's music videos play an important role in the the activism to save the sacred um, river um, from a Chinese mega dam project. Um, uh, this particular music video is from their new album um, and really is highlighting issues at the intersection of self determination for kitchen people and um, natural resource and land issues. So let's play the clips.
থে আনছে Thank you, Emily, for sharing those. I look forward to digging into that more. We are going to move on to Tasca. Hello, everyone. Uh, my, I'm Tosca Santoso. Uh, I'm a former journalist. So I spent my professional career for more than 30 years as a journalist. Uh, some of them also write uh, fictions, like the book that I want to share with you. But now uh, I'm mostly my time I spend as a farmer, as a coffee farmer in a small village in uh, West Java province. It's about three hours drive from Jakarta. So I, I stay in the village. Uh, uh, I wrote the novel in 2012, so 10 years ago, as a part of my uh, participation to document it, uh, the process of uh, deforestation in Indonesia. So I think the main narrative of uh, management forests in Indonesia, uh, even before the Indonesian Republic set up so from the Dutch colonial. It's uh, the, the way that we can say like uh, from the developmentalist uh, regime. Yeah? So they see the forest as uh, resources that they can extractively use for economic growth. Uh, at the moment, the, the most uh, lucrative is from palm oil industry and, and uh, mining, especially coal mining that they take from the forest. So, but with my story, I try to, to see from the different angle that this deforestation have a very bad impact to the, the environment, also for the people who live around the forest. Uh, I create a story that show how to, it's based, mainly actually based on the research, what happened in Indonesia, but uh, I write it on uh, fictions uh, that uh, show how the deforestation uh, uh, really bad impact in Indonesia, especially in the, uh, all, on the or, uh, new order in a period after 65 to, to 98, yeah? That's the most uh, 
massive deforestation in Indonesia that uh, yearly sometimes it's one one million, sometimes two million hectares uh, forest lost. So uh, I wrote the novel and ten years ago and as a counter and also the documentation what happened here and and sometimes it also could impact for the readers yeah especially for the youth who interest in the story of forest they read the novel and then that uh, want to know what is the reforestation program that i do with the farmers in the village now so I spend my time now to uh, mainly to the reforestation of the land graded area in in West Java, uh, farming coffee and and also uh, spreading the idea of the uh, reforestations and uh, approach young generation to to care about the forest. Oh. Uh, I would like to read some part of the novel, if you don't mind, so maybe Jamin can show this. is about the uh, forest in Java. I will read in Indonesian language, so uh, 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 my friend Jamin can put a, a, a translation in, in a PowerPoint. Yeah? Pulau ini seperti dihukum kelebihan beban. Tiap detik penduduknya bertambah tiga orang, tiap saat area hutannya makin berkurang. Saat ini ada 130 juta orang mendiami areal hanya 13 juta hektar di Jawa. Kepadatan rata-rata penduduk seribu jiwa per kilometer persegi. Jalan Anyer Panarukan yang dulu direntes Dendes, sekarang menjadi kampung sambung menyambung, menjadikan deretan pemukiman padat terpanjang di bumi. Karena desakan kebutuhan, hutan menjadi prioritas paling belakang untuk diselamatkan. Padahal dua abad lalu, Jawa masih sebagian besar tertutup rimba Ketika Raffles menjabat Gubernur Jenderal Jawa tahun 1811, dia memperkirakan 4 per 5 dari area Jawa masih berupa hutan rimba. Maka waktu itu 10 juta hektar lebih hutan menutupi Jawa. Aku tahu kamu punya masalah sendiri menjaga keseimbangan kebutuhan petani dan kelestarian hutan di Sarungkit. Kisah tentang hutan pasir pogor yang angker dekat kita menanam pohon lalu mudah-mudahan membantu kamu mempertahankan hutan itu dari jaran petani yang lapar tanah. Memang tidak mudah menjaga alam ketika warga sekitarnya terjerat kemiskinan. Dan serangan kepada hutan tidak hanya muncul dari ledakan penduduk yang lapar. Kehancuran hutan terutama juga dipicu oleh keserakahan. Pada awalnya hutan di Jawa dirusak oleh perusahaan-perusahaan Belanda, masa ketika VOC berkuasa, mereka mengeksploitasi hutan jati Jawa dan meninggalkan kerusakan parah. Pemerintah Belanda kemudian melanjutkan industri perusakan itu demi mengejar pendapatan yang tinggi dari industri kapal. Aku berharap program adopsi pohon di tempatmu akan berhasil supaya area hutan Jawa tidak terus-menerus menyempit. Sebab hutan yang hilang tak pernah punah sendirian. Thank you, friend. Thank you, Kelsey. I think that's my... Uh... Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, so we have a couple of questions that the group decided on in a really interesting conversation prior to this. So we have three main questions that we're probably going to spend about 10 to 15 minutes on each one. 
Um, each panelist can respond to the question. These are things we, as I've mentioned, all thought about um, before and we're interested in sharing with you. And so the panelists are welcome to be in conversation with each other as they answer these questions um, and ask each other questions as well. So like I said, there's three questions. We'll try to give each one about 10 to 15 minutes. And then after that, we will move on to questions from the audience. So our first question, um, and I think I'll also copy and paste it into the chat uh, so that everybody, including the panelists, can see it and refer back to it, is what are the mainstream or conventional narratives about the transitions you are documenting, and how does your work challenge or trouble these mainstream narratives? Um, and so again, anyone can answer this in any order we want and build upon conversations with each other. Hello. Yeah. Uh, uh, main narrative in man forest management in Indonesia, as far I know, is the forest they see as uh, resources for the extractive industries, mainly palm oil and uh, mining, coal mining. So, so if you notice that uh, maybe four or five Indonesian regions family are uh, take the, the wealthy from, from the palm oil. So forest is under big pressure and they're justified as part of the developmental agenda. So Indonesia for so many, I think four or five decades, uh, actually still until now, uh, have the uh, idea of developmentalist uh, economy and forest is resources that they rely on. But actually, this also put a big negative impact on this destruction of the forest. So I put my story based on these uh, counter uh, ideas that we don't have to exploit forest. Uh, I think it's enough for Indonesia to, to have uh, palm oil like we have now. We need no more to expand it. Uh, we should. Uh, see the forest as part of our life. And this is very, still many things that we don't know about the forest. And we have to keep the things that we still have and do the rehabilitation for the, for the uh, degradation forest. But unfortunately, the deforestation still happens, especially in the Eastern part of Indonesia, in Papua, I think that's the virgin forest that um, uh, the last forest that uh, I'm worried will be uh, destroyed also. Tosca, how are you challenging that? Uh, yeah, I think versus we have to have counter narrative on it and we use spreading the ideas and, and support, yes, M mainly the uh, environmentalist movement also. Uh, robust here, yeah? Greenpeace and other organizations have uh, many activities. Um, I think the, the most uh, important area is to change on the uh, government and private sector uh, ideas. Yeah, they, they have to adopt the new, the new uh, world of view about the forest. What about the local knowledge, Tosca? Like the local, local knowledge and wisdom. Are are yeah, you also in, bringing in a small uh -huh. in a small uh, scale? It is very important. Yeah, like what we have uh, actually in West Java that I book now. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a traditional notion about agroforestry. Uh, we mm -hmm. call talun in in Sundanese language. So this is the the, the way that's more proper. Uh, managing forests with the, also the still using for the benefit of economic uh, from for the farmers around the forest. Mm. Uh, the right of indigenous people mm -hmm. should be respected uh, and 
uh, and it helps if, uh, but you know, you know the, the, the structure of law, the national law, it's very repressive to them. Mm -hmm. Emily, I'm so sorry, but I want to ask you a question. <laughs> but I, I mean, I, that music video, which is, I loved it. I thought it was just so incredible. And, you know, just the, what they were expressing, you know, in the song. And, you know, it really came from their heart and, what, you know, what they were going through. And I, I feel like that in itself was like uh, challenging the mainstream narrative. I was wondering if you could just say a little bit more about the video. Thanks, Kalyani. I see your your story listening mm -hmm. skills in in motion. <laughs> and it didn't be your storytelling skills. Um, yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, this particular video, I think, really it actually comes out of their deep collaboration with um, an environmental group called Kitchen Development Networking Group, and um, one of the things that they're trying to shift is um, the Myanmar state constitution, which was drafted by the military, um, claims that all land and natural resources above and below the ground are all owned by the government, right? All owned mm -hmm. by the state. And so what they're really challenging um, in, in terms of um, activism and also in this video is to say that actually, you know, we need to rewrite that constitution. And, and the only way to um, move past the utter devastation that has been rendered on, on the Kachin landscapes being the most, you know, natural resource area in Myanmar um, is to allow local native peoples to manage their own resources. So that, that's really the main message that comes through there. Um, and so I think what makes that particularly important is, is um, the, the, the moment the, you know, many people know, I think now, about a year ago now, there was an, a military coup in Myanmar. Um, but essentially for about five years, for the five year period that I was, making this film and collaborating with these activists and artists, it was a, a period of democratization. And, um, you know, the mainstream narrative was very much not what they're showing here, right? Mm -hmm. I think um, similar to what Tosca was saying, you know, it, the, the emphasis is always on development and, mm -hmm. you know, seeing these places, seeing Kitchen Land as, as a place to, from which to extract. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the connection there with the first clip that I showed, very different part of the country, right? Very mm -hmm. different community of artists. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think the thread there is artists really shining a light on what's, you know, what's going on politically um, in a country in the way that you don't see in the mainstream. And so the first clip was really showing, um, or from the first short film, is really focusing on the very beginning stages of that democratization period in which the mainstream narrative there was essentially, you know, um, like if you've seen kind of like, you know, films on Myanmar, they would show like the te beautiful temples and, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of like the balloons yeah. over Bagan, uh, mm -hmm. over the historical Bagan temples. You know, mm -hmm. I'm sure they probably have similar films about Cambodia as well, right? Yes. Oh my and God. Then, <laughs> totally. And then, uh -huh. and then um, mm -hmm. not that the temples aren't beautiful, they are beautiful, mm -hmm. but they're not the only story mm -hmm. that there is to be told, mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. and so a lot of the, you know, as, as Myanmar was kind of entering this opening, the, this um, economic transition, this you know democratic mm -hmm. transition, the the story that was being told was now, you know, Myanmar is emerging from this kind of dark age, and mm -hmm. suddenly, mm -hmm. as if from nowhere, into this like neoliberal modernity, right? Mm -hmm. When in fact there are, you know, so so performance artists are probably not front and center of that narrative, or in fact they're not, and you know, for us, it was um, performance artists could highlight 
a different narrative about what was going on in that very particular, um, particularly about the role of uh, art and, and fostering discussion and fostering, you know, uh, in a very politically restrictive environment. And so, um, so I think, um, yeah, in terms of those performance artists, I think um, one of the things you see in the clip is like people in the background, they want to see the performance art, right? They want to participate, but there is still a fear there, mm. right? And so even as performance artists are troubling and testing the water, you kind of see like, they're not used to performance artists doing these things. They're not used to women taking mm -hmm. up space in this way, in a very political way. And interestingly, the woman that you see, the performance artist, we were supposed to film outside, but it was raining that day. So mm. we filmed in this mall and actually she owns a tailor shop in mm. that mall, but people didn't even recognize her. Even her neighboring stalls were like, who is this weird lady? Um, and so, you know, kind of seeing her in a very mm. different light from everyday life. Um, but yeah, Kalyani, it's, I think it's your turn now to talk mm. a little bit about, you know, what moved you to, mm -hmm. to work on this short film and, you know, your other projects. I know you're also working on a feature um, mm -hmm. that I'm sure are both troubling these mm -hmm. um, or challenging these narratives about Cambodia. So I'd love to hear a little bit more from you as well. Oh, thank you, Emily. Um, I, I mean, I relate to both you, Tosca, and Emily, what you're saying, because I mean, the mainstream narrative is, you know, about development, is about this neoliberal, you know, development. Um, but also it's about like the beauty of Cambodia, you know, the temples, the, or it's about the poverty. It's like, it's you no, know, there's like nothing in between, you know, it's either beauty or it's poverty or it's the Khmer Rouge, you know, that's, that's like what people know Cambodia for. And um, what was, you know, really interesting to me, even though I'm, I didn't live there when I went to, you know, when I went there and I spent a lot of time living with the families, you know, it was like all those narratives were just something that we were showing to the world. But actually what we really possessed was our wisdom. And this is why I asked you, Tosca, is like, you know, what we really possess is our, the knowledge and wisdom of our ancestors you know, that come from the land, come from the water, come from the people who live with this land and water, you know, and that knowledge and wisdom, we, we're not proud of, you know, and I think it's because of what we went through, through the Khmer Rouge, you know, we had this civil war where people were, you know, being 2 million people were killed by their own people. So I think that there is something in us that are afraid to accept ourselves you know, accept who we are and accept, you know, the wisdom that exists within us. You know, we're always looking outwards, looking at other people and looking at ways to like, you know, develop as a country or to, to prog progress and move forward, you know, and, um, and do what everyone else is doing, you know, and, 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 and you know, Tosca, you know this so well. I mean, like the, all the deforestation, the palm oil plantations, you know, we're doing exactly what other people are doing, you know, taking advantage of the land as a natural resource rather than living with the land, you know, in community and in, um, which is how our ancestors used to live. You know, so I think for me, my, what I lived with the families and I learned these things, I realized how important it is to really show that story you know, share the story and share the wisdom of our ancestors, ancestors that come from our people. And that is the way to, um, to counter and to challenge that conventional narrative, you know, which is just about, um, which is really just not even seeing ourselves for who we are, but seeing ourselves through the lens of someone else which is, you know, the colonizer or, you know, the oppressor or, you know, whoever is doing the oppression right now, which is capitalism, but also the people who are in power. Um, so really valuing our traditional knowledge and wisdom. I think it's, you know, it's so important. And, and, I, and I, I would like to, you know, um, 
I think that's 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 something that I've always wanted to do is to you know to share that. So I really appreciate you know Tosca and Kelly and um, Emily, you know you sharing the work that you're doing, which is is also you know highlighting that as well. Thank you. I think that is a great segue into our next question, especially Kalyani. I think you've started to dig into this. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what is the role of storytelling in various, a lot of different ways um, in illuminating ruptures and transitions in Southeast Asia? And again, I'm going to copy and paste this question and put it in the chat. And again, whoever wants to dig in and start off with this question is fine. I think, Kalyani, you are really starting to get into this a little bit with what you were saying. So you're welcome to pick up uh, right there. But yeah, I actually, anyone is I, maybe I can just ask a question to Tosca. Um, you know, Tosca, you were a journalist before, you know, then you were a writer and then you became a coffee farmer. I'm really curious, like, um, you know, because, you know, the question is, what is the role of storytelling? But I feel like you can tell stories in so many different ways, you know, and, and, and I'm wondering, like, how did you make that move, you know, from journalism to, to fiction and then to being a coffee farmer? <laughs> you know, because that might answer the question, too, about how, you know, what the role of storytelling can be. Uh, yeah, maybe just because getting old. <laughs> That's a good answer too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, but I did started you, a journalist uh, as uh, when very very young, yeah, in, under Indonesian repression military regime. Yeah. So I have uh, experience on organizing underground magazines. Some of my journalists was arrested. So. Uh, I call for journalism is to to spread the truth news for the people. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Then, uh, when the democracy come, I'm a little bit less interested to to that call. And uh, environmental issue is more interesting for me. And mm -hmm. then I start writing fiction in ten years mm -hmm. ago, and then and now I enjoy it the farming just go to the farm and this is the uh, time for coffee seasons in my village so uh, mm -hmm. harvest harvest coffee next month is very interesting mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. but i have question to kalyani uh, you mentioned about home when you you talk in the, your presentation and after your experience uh, you leave your country in very early uh, uh, age yeah and where you feel home now? Mm. <laughs> you know, that's that's a very good question. You know, I, I I actually went to live in Cambodia for two years, mm -hmm. um, about in 2016 and 17, because I didn't feel at home here in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. I, and when I went there, I realized that the redwoods and the mountains were calling me here <laughs> back <laughs> to California, <laughs> you know? And, and then I also realized that home is not a physical place, uh -huh. you know? It's, okay. it's actually the people that you love. And I, I actually came back to my husband who was my partner and we, I, we got <laughs> <Yeah>. married <laughs> and sealed the deal. <laughs> but, you know, it was hard before because I didn't, I think the reason why I was, I felt so, you know, disconnected was because I wasn't connected. You know, I wasn't connected to what home means, you yeah. know, and, and I think what home means is really living in relationship with the land and living in relationship with your community and with your family and, yeah. you know, and, and being appreciative and grateful for what you have. And because of the way that I grew up in, you know, Tosca, you may not be familiar with 
the you know American society in this way, but people are very competitive. You know, mm. everybody is like out to like achieve something, accomplish something, be successful, you know, and that way of living is really taxing on the body and on the mind mm. and the spirit. And it really takes you away from what is important. You know, and I think that is the kind of way of living that has that's also been exported abroad, you know, to Cambodia as well as to Indonesia, you know, this whole perception of the land as being a natural resource, you know, rather than a place that you live with and that you protect and you honor. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, that's, I think I realized that, <laughs> I came to realize that home is, yeah, not just a physical place, but yeah, really just a you. way of being, yeah. So I, I honor you, Tosca, in your work. You know, I think, you know, Actually, uh, the reason why I asked your question of you is because, you know, you moved from journalism, which was to like tell, you know, like, you know, tell stories, but in a very like confined way. And then you moved to telling fiction, which is telling stories in a very imaginative way and creative way. Mm -hmm. And then you're telling stories with coffee farming too. You know, you're telling the story of your ancestors and how they've, you know, worked and lived with the land. Um, so, yeah, I just, I find that all really interesting. <laughs> Emily. Yeah, just, yes. no, no, I was just going to jump in here because, yeah, no, I think what you said Kalyani really like resonates with something I've been what one of the stories I was thinking about recently um in terms of like how much how easy it is to get disconnected from the land um you know um not that yeah not that you have to be a farmer to yeah. to be connected with the land right that's mm -hmm. one way it's a very important way um but yeah I think that connection um mm -hmm. is something that blast music has been really powerful in um in telling stories that help people re reconnect mm -hmm. to the land in a different way and actually one of their um one of their first um one of their one of their um early music videos um akala um which there's like, there's no English translation. We've, I've talked about this with a lot of people, but it means something like, um, oh, the pain. It's sort of like in a, it's like, oh, this is painful or whatever. And so mm. that actual emotion in, in that song, in that music video is um, what the land feels. It's actually an expression mm. of the feelings from the land itself. And, um, you know, some of the lyrics are like, um, the forests are crying, the mountains mm. are crying, like even the jade is crying. And um, like when you were sharing that experience that you had, Kalyani, of like needing to go away in order to reconnect. Actually, mm. in my in my book project, one of the one of the most powerful um, interviews that I did was with a an activist, kitchen activist about my age, actually, and she told me about um i think i think really her experience is kind of what clarified for me like this is the power of of storytelling whether it's the music video or whether it's like film or whatever because she was telling me like back when she was young and growing up in burma myanmar she used to watch the news and um she used to watch the news and after the and you know it's state TV, it's state propaganda, right? And then after the news, you watch the news only so you can watch the movies after. And everybody loves watching movies because you <laughs> want to watch stories. But all the movies were war movies and they were basically another form of propaganda. Mm. And, um, you know, she was talking about how, who, like, the hero of those stories was was the soldier, the Bama soldier. Um, and, uh, she didn't find out until much later, actually, when she moved abroad and um, to North America. And she 
was like, okay, actually, you know, I was cheering for the wrong side. <laughs> like, why was mm -hmm. I cheering for the Bama soldier? It was actually my community who was framed as this like ethnic rebels, right? Wow. And and so it, it, she told me she had to do a lot of unlearning of that kind of internalized colonialism mm -hmm. from those movies. And then, but it was when she was abroad where she watched these music videos from Blast and that was actually her the beginning of her activism mm. she said was like that music not the music video i showed you but the one about like um the mountains are crying right mm. like that was for her the first time where she felt like actually there's a connection there's a deeper connection here between us and the land mm. and if we like when we hurt the land when we hurt nature around us like it is we're also destroying ourselves and I think it was from, so for her, that was the beginning of her activism. And I just thought like, wow, like, you know, only, I think there's very few artists that have that kind of pivotal impact on people. And Blast might not be famous around the world, although I'm working to change that. <laughs> but, you know, being able to impact one person in that way, like for your storytelling to have that impact that you can feel like a shift in thinking about the land, your mm. relationship to the land and what you want to do about it is just, I don't know. I thought that was really powerful. Wow. I mean, that's amazing. That's an incredible story. It, it actually reminds me of, um, you know, when we had the screening of A River Changes Course, which is the first feature that I worked on. And it's about three families living in Ratanak, Korea, in the northeastern part of Cambodia, in the jungle. A family living on the Belay Sap, you know, a Cham family, which is an ethnic minority in Cambodia. And in, in the northeast was the Jedi family and also an ethnic minority in Cambodia. And then a Khmer family in Spidean. And we had a screening, just like the premiere of the film was we had a screening at a Chen La Theater in Phnom Penh. And a, one woman stood up after the screening, you know, of the film and she was Jam. And she, you know, had a scarf around her hijab and, you know, and she said that for the first time in her life, she felt like she was Cambodian. You know, like she felt like she was part of the social fabric of this country. And uh, it, it felt very um, powerful for her. And I just like, I was really stunned, you know, I didn't expect it, but I, that moment already always, um, you know, I, I think about it and I, you know, just the same way that you're, you know, the story that you're telling is like the stories that we grow up with that are told to us, you know, like that we're not worthy or that we're not good enough or that we're not part of the social fabric or we're not, you know, Khmer, we're not Cambodian or whatever. Those stories stay with us. And until we're shown otherwise, you know, that those stories can stay with us for the rest of our lives. So the stories can be stories that people say, tell us, or they can be things that we watch, you know, on, on screen, you know, on television. You know, I know I grew up with a lot of stories um, that were mostly about white families here in the United States, <laughs> you know, and I felt like I needed to become white in order to be part of this country. You know, so yeah, Emily, thank you for reminding me of that with your story. <laughs> That's really powerful. And, you know, and, and it, yeah, like you say, it doesn't matter if, um, if the band is known all over the world, they're making an impact you know, for the Kachin people. And that is, you know, that's really incredible. Well, Kalyani, it sounds like mm -hmm. you've already had that impact, mm -hmm. at least on one person. I know many more with your work, so oh, that's you. amazing. And mm -hmm. you can retire now. You've already had, <laughs> you know, you like. <laughs> oh, so many stories to tell, right? <laughs> All right, so we so have Emily. Emily, how uh, about the dams in Kachin? Is finished or still on uh, developing? Or because after the coup, maybe the different situation. Huh? Um, yeah, that's true. It's actually um, changed a lot. The struggle against the dam has changed significantly um throughout the process and it's still temporarily halted um after the coup they said that 
um, the regime basically wanted to restart all the hydropower projects because you know they're desperate for money right it's like more sanctions and then they they're turning to where they think there's a surefire way to generate income um especially from a dam like the mid dam where 90 percent of the electricity would go to china so it's very little local um benefit um but it's still you know it's it's still temporarily halted and but you know activists are still fighting to 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 ask for the full cancellation of the dam um so that's ongoing um and with the activists that i'm working with and also um we're hoping when we do release the film that um, we can really amplify those efforts um in a global way mm -hmm. Okay, so we have one last question. Um, we have about 12 minutes remaining, um, and then we can also keep an eye out uh, for any uh, audience questions. The last one is, what is your journey in storytelling? What kinds of changes in your personal journeys or careers are you experiencing? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and how are these changes related to transitions in Southeast Asia? And Again, I will put it in the chat for everyone to refer to. Um, and anyone that wants to take this on first can go for it. Kalyani, I vote you should go first. We heard a little <laughs> bit about Tosca's journey. So let's let's hear about uh... yours. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I've, I, I guess I told you the story of, <laughs> of me like finding home and everything. Um, um, I think the past few years I've realized that, you know, all this time, even though I've been working in Cambodia, which is my homeland, I, I realized that all this time I've been listening to the stories of others, you know, in Cambodia and other families and, um, you know, telling, helping them to tell their stories, you know, like Pala that you saw, you know, in Lost World. But while I was working on Lost World, I realized that that story was also autobiographical. You know, that, 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 that story that I was telling about the sand being moved, you know, from Cambodia to Singapore is also the story of my family, too. You know, we were taken from our homeland to another place, you know, completely uprooted. You know, and what I saw in the sand, you know, when I was working in um, filming in the mangrove forest is that it's so beautiful, <laughs> you know, the sand is like sparkling white, you know, it's like on the shore of the island, you know, we would we'd, we'd go to um, uh, which is Lover's Island. And I would spend like days there. I think of all the time that I spent in, you know, in Gosar Lao, most of the time was spent on this island, even though only a few shots appeared in the film. <laughs> But most of the time I spent on this island because I was just so like enamored, you know, by the beauty. And um, the sand was just so beautiful. Like just looking at it closely, looking at all of the, the animals and the creatures that, that like lived in the sand, that burrowed in it, you know, the clams that you saw that they were digging out of the sand, you know, and the mollusk and the fish that, you know, that are able to, you know, lay their eggs because of the sand and because of the mangrove forest that grows from the sand. So I saw the sand for the beauty of the sand in this, as part of this forest. But then when we went to Singapore, the sand was completely disconnected from the forest. And it was just barren, it had no life, nothing. It was just piles of sand. 
hot and dry sand. No meaning, no connection, no family, no community, no forest. Um, but it had a value that was, you know, that can be commodified. You know, it had a dollar value. Um, but it wasn't even that much. It's like maybe $20 million or something. That's nothing compared to the true value of the sand. So when I saw that, the transporting of the sand to, you know, Singapore, I actually saw myself. And, you know, and I felt like I didn't understand my, the value of myself all my life because I was disconnected you know, from my homeland and from the forest where I belong. Um, but, you know, we're resilient, right? We find new forests to become part of. <laughs> so, yeah, to answer your question, Emily, and thank you for offering it to me to answer. Um, I think my journey has brought me back to myself and to the story of my family. And I realized that, um, instead of hiding behind the camera and trying to tell the stories of others that in order to complete that healing process for myself and my family that I need to tell the story of my family. And so um, this fall I'm planning to walk across Cambodia with my sister and um, revisit all the places that have you know, become home to me with the families that I've met along the way and then retrace the path that my family and I took when we escaped Cambodia. And um, yeah, and I hope through this journey that my sister and I will learn more about ourselves and about each other and about our country, but also about our family, our parents, especially our mother who is still alive. Um, we're gonna take her stories with us as we travel. So I think that realization really um, helped me to understand like, you know, and, and, and Emily, what you said earlier really resonated with me that, you know, when you, you, you really went on this journey to question anthropology, you know, as a discipline, you know, to question academia as a, as a, a way of life, you know, like we're taught to be objective, you know, we're taught to, you know, to like gather data and to tell stories and, you know, to, you know, put everyone else on the spot, but not really ourselves. And um, that has been used as a tool, you know, to um, colonize and conquer and, and, and control other people. And uh, so I, I want to turn that camera on myself now instead of, you know, <laughs> exploiting. And I, ha I know I haven't been exploiting the stories of others, but, you know, I think maybe if more of us, you know, told our own stories and shared those stories, um, maybe we wouldn't have that problem of exploitation, you know. Uh, so I, yeah, I'd like to, uh, you know, I think with the mapping project that, that I'm part of with Amanda and with MSU, Michigan State University, I think it's going to be really wonderful to, we're going to Cambodia the next two weeks um, and we're going to be with communities there and it, it's going to be a really, yeah, it's going to be wonderful to like find a way to help communities tell their own stories. And I think technology is, you know, really enabling that you know, with the use of cell phones and all kinds of stuff. So yeah, maybe that is the transition, <laughs> another transition in storytelling, you know, that we can make. So Emily, since you <laughs> volunteered me, maybe you can go next. <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready to turn the camera on myself yet, um, yeah. maybe. Maybe uh, a lot of my students have been doing that. Um, part of it is like a, is a COVID thing. It's like yeah. because of the challenges of filmmaking. Actually, the the solution is often, hey, I can yeah. be my own subject <laughs> because you know. Um, and honestly, you know, I'm not just talking about the pandemic, but and maybe I'm not ready to turn the camera on myself yet. But um, 
in my written work, I, I feel like I've also had a turn inwards, not necessarily, um, not that the story is about me, like my book, mm -hmm. my book project, for example, it's, it's not about my family. It's not about our history. Um, but, you know, and that's a sort of a complex one because like people often ask you, especially in anthropology, if you're sort of ethnically marked in any way, they don't under, they, there's this I, question of like, why aren't you studying your own people? <laughs> 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 Which is like, and that, that's, a whole, that's a whole other thing. And yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, um, you know, only unmarked people, mm, white folks get to tell stories about other communities without being questioned. Right. But actually, I really do think I should be questioned, um, not just because I'm half white, but also because I am an outsider. Right. I, I'm not from Myanmar. I'm not, you know, so I think part of my turn to autoethnography in my writing, um, which is kind of just a fancy way of like bringing myself into the writing process and my own experience is because um, because of, you know, some of the things that you mentioned, Kalyani, um, of that sort of um, ethos of objectivity, like that, that has been the cause of so much harm. Right. And we've seen it over and over again. Somehow we haven't yet learned the lesson. Right. Mm -hmm. Like whether it's in journalism or anthropology or any of these mm -hmm. disciplines. Um, and I think actually, if you look at the complicity of anthropology within colonialism, it's not from any explicit alignment with colonial powers. Anthropologists, even if they were also fighting for the British, didn't you know, actually mm -hmm. the, the cause of, of that complicity was 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 this um quote unquote value free anthropology this idea that um they could be objective even while at, at all right and so um you know for me like part of the reason why i look at so, so my book project is called borderland solidarity why solidarity is an important concept um in my work is that actually you know, often when we're doing research or we're making a film, mm -hmm. it appears as though it's just us and the yeah. people that we're documenting, right? But actually there's always that invisible third party. Like there's always that more powerful third party, whether it's the government or the corporation, often it's both, right? In a lot mm -hmm. of the context that we're working in, and I think there's a lot of connections between our work, it is that, you know, more powerful third piece. and so because of that um i think it's really important to to uh, attend to my own positionality what are the ways that as as a foreigner how can i be situated in this especially in in, in this period of transition in which i was doing my work right there's all these foreign experts flying in getting to do things that honestly they shouldn't be doing like mm -hmm. rewriting the laws of the country yes right and mm -hmm. being um, being told they can do whatever they want. Right. And so like, you know, I may not have that intention coming in, mm -hmm. but I have a lot of privileges and yes. I am mm -hmm. often in places where I shouldn't be. And so attending to that through the writing process, I think has been important. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also just the reality is, is everything I do, my film work or anything else has really been informed by my own personal experience as well. Um, but Tosca, I want to make sure we have time to hear from you before we wrap as well. Um, yeah. Anything that you'd like to share about your journey and, and how it's how you've been challenged um, as a storyteller or anything else you want to share about your journey? Yeah, I, as you mentioned, I think I told my story from journalist to farmer and I think uh, now I like to continue my books to advocate about the uh, uh, local wisdom on on uh, maintaining our forest and promoting the ideas. So, yeah, but that's a good point to 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 turn the camera to myself. Yeah, especially if you think <laughs> uh, if you 
getting limited time. That's a good point. Too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for inviting us to uh, share this story. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Kalyani, Emily, and Tosca. This was a really enlightening discussion. Um, thank you again to the University of Hawaii East West Center and Michigan State University for putting on this webinar series on Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, this particular one, which again was chronicling transitions, documentarians, and writers. Uh, thank you everyone for attending and thank you again for the panelists for their brilliance and creativity.